on different services. Um, real estate, you can have two pieces of land, one person thinks it's worth so much money, another person disagrees and has a different value on that. Um, people differ in the money, the value they put on a stock, or a new technology, or a, a fashion trend, or different currencies. Some people might think the euro is looking good today, the dollar will look good tomorrow, the yen is looking good a week from now. Um, brand name merchandise, works of art, clean environment, religious salvation, right? We have different preferences. I like to be saved by a certain type of um, religious service. Someone else might be want to saved by a different type of religious service. I mean, we're not getting the same thing. We're distinguishing between I would get saved in a certain way and that's why I believe in this type of creed um, or this type of religion. Now, the thing is that markets are really good at trading commodities because they're combining price and quantity, but they're not really good at assets because, you know, it, there's always some like slippage in like the subjective value people are putting onto these intangible subjective things because those can change in time, right? I might have a positive view on the euro today, but tomorrow I might turn sour on it. And these things can change, and because they can change and they're depending upon people's state of mind, okay, there's a lot of, you know, um, the market might not price it very well. There might be a lot of, let's say, noise in, let's say, the market signals. Now let's just think about this as the human body and think of it in terms of an asset, meaning the subjective value we put on um, subsets of the human body that have some interaction with each other. For example, you might be able to, if you could, sell your bone marrow for about $23 million, your DNA for about 10 million, antibodies for about 7, lungs for a little over $100,000, kidneys uh, $90,000, a heart for 57000 and if you totaled up all the actual pieces of your body, you could say as an asset, right, the DNA meaning I like DNA because you have straight blonde hair um, and you have a, you know, a tall physique and you digest cholesterol um, without any ill effects and things of that sort. Those are subjective, intangible asset qualities to the human body. And we all put different values on different people. Um, and if you're thinking about selling your body as an asset, it might be worth up to $47 million. But if you broke down the human body into the actual substances, like if you broke it down to the elements and compounds that make up the human body, and you looked at the market price for, let's say, your oxygen um, molecules and, or your uh, hydrogen molecules and your carbon mo uh, molecules, the value of the human body as a commodity is only about $4.50. And so the point is there can be gaps between us, the subjective value put on something and the objective value. Now, just once go back to our notions of the pre-modern economy and the modern economy. In the pre-modern economy, we're, it's mostly barter. We're dealing in commodities, right? We're dealing in things that we can actually see and touch and we know what it is, right? I can see a cob of corn or I can see a, a cut of meat. I kind of know what I'm getting when I'm making this exchange. But in the modern economy, most of what's exchanged are assets things that have subjective values, things that the price and values can change depending on changing states of mind. Um, this can make a modern economy relatively unstable. So let me just give you an example of like the modern economy. Now if we looked at the international merchandise trades and goods and services, which means uh, actual tangible physical things that are being traded in the world economy um, every year, it's about 13 to 16 trillion dollars a year, which is a lot. Okay, the U.S. Uh, GDP, the amount we produce in goods and services every year, is about $14 trillion. That was uh, before the uh, financial crisis, but gives you a rough number um, to think about the size of our economy. And if you look at the global GDP, the actual produ production of things, goods and services, tangible things, it's about $60 trillion. But that, those real things that are being traded is not most of what's being traded in the economy. What mostly is being traded in the economy is paper, i.e. ownership in companies, uh, bonds, claims to other people's debt, um, commercial paper, and things of that sort. And if you look at the value of all that commercial financial assets before the financial crisis, there's $140 trillion worth of paper being exchanged. Now think about that. The world economy, $60 trillion large. But there's $140 trillion 
And remember, this is because these are claims on not just the present, but also the past and the future. We have $140 trillion worth of financial assets uh, circulating in the global economy with people's valuations of them going up and down, as you can see in the stock markets. One day, you know, geez, it's wonderful to have the French stock market. Another day, it's horrible to have the French stock market. Um, another day, the Nikkei is doing really well. Another day, the Nikkei is doing really poorly. The valuations on these things are uh, pretty fl Now, I want to talk a little bit about something called fictitious commodities. And fictitious commodities um, are th commodity things that are not really commodities. They're not really physical things. But to have a modern economy, um, you have to basically be able to make these treat these things as if, and the key thing here is as if they were actually commodities. And the three basic fictitious commodities are money, um, or capital, um, land, or um, you know, which is another word for nature. Um, and I'll go over these different things in a second. And labor, i.e., human activity. Now, none of these things are real commodities. Let me just give you um, an example. Money is sterile, right? Money is veiled. It's just a system of accounting. So when you're buying and selling money, it's like buying and selling an inch. Not an inch of something, but the inch. Well, how can you really do that, right? How can you charge someone for a measurement, right? It shouldn't be able to do that because really all it's standing in for, it's just a way of communicating my cows into your chickens. It's not actually a thing in itself. It's just kind of like a stand-in, a symbol, a signifier. So the point is, how could you actually buy and sell money? What we do in the modern economy, right? We lend money at interest and we get money back. So we're loaning money, people money so they can buy things and then they pay us back for the use of that money. We buy and sell different currencies, right? I might need yen now or dollars later. We don't use the same currency. And so we do actually treat it sometimes like a commodity. And uh, so the, the, but we have to make, when money starts going away from actual physical things like lumps of gold, okay, it's a fictitious commodity because it's not really a thing anymore. Gold was a thing, but why is a $20 uh, bill worth $20? It's not because of the paper. It's not because of the green ink. Um, there's something else going on here. Um, and we think about earning money, buying and selling money, trading in money, money markets, things of that sort. Now, I just want to point out that this is a relatively novel new idea. Uh, for most of human history, we had things like the sin of usury, which was religious prohibition saying we can't lend money at interest. Um, really, these things continued almost to the 1800s, well through the 1800s in most of Europe. Um, to this day, in the Middle East, um, there's restrictions on lending money at interest. Um, you have religions forbidding um, different financial institutions. Um, so anyone that's seen Angels and Demons or the Da Vinci Code, uh, you have these people called Templars. These were knights during the Crusades. There's a lot of speculation that they were in charge of the Jerusalem Temple's basically cash hoard. Um, they were involved in transporting money from Western Europe into the kingdoms of the Middle East during the Crusades. Um, and they became very powerful, maybe too powerful. And so the Templars were cracked down on by the Catholic Church and, you know, stripped of their uh, privileges. And these Templars, you know, they had a cross. And many of them, when they were ex uh, expelled from France and Italy and other places, ended up in Switzerland. And you kind of see that cross to this day. The Swiss flag is very similar to the Templar cross. There might be a connection here. There's also this idea that money is a very dirty thing, that, uh, uh, you know, it's filthy lucre, to use one phrase. And when we compare, let's say, Wall Street versus Main Street, uh, Main Street is virtuous because they actually make things. They give us services. They make things in factories. Um, you know, that's okay that they make you make money that way. But a lot of people have a problem with Wall Street because they don't actually make anything. They start with money they use money to make money and that's just kind of all like you know smoke and mirrors magic tricks and so we generally don't have a very negative issue about people who make money um, in uh, by tra uh, trafficking and intangible things 
The other thing that has to be made into a commodity is land. But land is not a commodity. It's not made for anything. No one made, you know, well, I mean, yes, you could make land, Netherlands, Japan, etc. But basically, most of the land is just basically the air. It's nature. It's not produced to be sold on a market. And this idea that we could buy and sell plots of land, once again, is a relatively new and novel custom. Think about, you know, uh, the somewhat, you know, urban legend about selling Manhattan for $24. The Dutch came to uh, the area around New York. They said, um, we'll give you $24 worth of trinkets. You give us the Isle of Manhattan. Now, you might think, and I'm not trying to, like, uh, say the you know, natives were very simple-minded, um, and I think actually there's a lot more to the story that I'm going to be able to tell here. But uh, think about these, you know, Native Americans thinking, wow, we got such a great deal. These stupid Dutch people think they can take this island and, you know, take it and carry it back to Netherlands. But you know what? They can't. It's still going to be free to everyone who could own land. Um, and I got $24 uh, dollars worth of, you know, sparkly stuff. Um there's no national borders when you look from the bird's eye view, right? The birds don't see where France begins and Germany ends or where Canada begins and the United States ends. Um, the idea of eminent domain, that uh, you might think you own your land, but it really doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the state. <laughs> it belongs to governments, or at least that's how most people think about it. If you've seen the uh, movie Braveheart, you get an example of this, that the land really belongs to God, and God gave the land to your king, who then parceled it out to their lords, who parceled it out to their vassals, who parceled it out to the serf. Um, which meant that, you know, there were prior claims that you couldn't do what you want with your land because the eminent domain, the higher authority, could take it back at any time they wanted to. And I think of a very funny cartoon, um, you know, posters with God uh, saying, you know, God making an announcement to the inhabitants of Earth, and it says, Earth, this is God. I want you all to move out by the end of the month because I have another client interested in the property. And so, you know, there is that kind of idea that goes back and, you know, it is pretty strong in pre-capitalist societies. Um, and partially it's that people belong to the land. The land doesn't belong to people. So the whole Middle Ages and even really primitive world is that if I bought the land, I also bought the people living on the land. Right? So if I became the uh, lord of this uh, section of land, all the people living on it used to become my subjects or my possessions. Another part to this is the tragedy of the commons, that um, it used to be a lot of land didn't belong to anyone, it was common land. So if you had something like Central Park or the Boston Commons, there was a place where everyone could like graze their animals. Um, or there were forests, because everyone needed fuel, and so there were public forests, and if you needed energy, you went into the forest, you chopped down a tree, and um, you know, you kept your house warm. Now, I'm not saying there weren't woodcutters, like you have in all the fairy tales, right? People can go in, cut wood, and then sell it. But what you couldn't do is you couldn't keep people out of the forest and say, this is my land, no one else can use it. And there was something called the enclosure movement right before the Industrial Revolution, which was basically that all this common land, all this land that supposedly belongs to everyone, um, they started to put fences around it and say, well, this land belongs to me and that land belongs to you and things of that sort, and we started to get this institution of private property.